I'm Charlotte of Charlotte Russell Contemporary in Art Gallery in Raleigh, North Carolina. I currently have a show on view called Art Ritual. It's on view through May 26, 2021. It features six artists. Um, half of them are based in the Triangle area, pr primarily Raleigh, and the other half are from the Bay Area. And I'm happy to have Rebecca Kaufman from San Francisco here to talk about her pieces on view. So welcome, Rebecca. Hi, everyone. Thank you all so much for coming. Uh, I guess I will get started then. Um, my name is Rebecca Kaufman. I am, like Charlotte said, I'm an artist in, in the San Francisco Bay Area. I've been here for about six years. I came here in uh, 2015 to study painting um, in, uh, at the San Francisco Art Institute, which is very sadly now closed after 150 years. Um, Anyhow, I, I got my MFA, I graduated in 2017, and I decided that's it, this is the place for me. So I am I am working here now. Um, okay, so I'm gonna share my screen. Um, let's see, oh. And uh, so the, what I'm gonna do is talk briefly about, you know what, I'm gonna set a, start a stopwatch so I don't, you know, get too carried away. Uh, I'm, what I'm going to do is um, talk briefly about each painting uh, that's in the exhibition, Art Ritual. And I'm going to talk about um, my conceptual intent behind these paintings and, and how it relates to ritual. And I'm also going to talk about uh, my, the actual physical process of, of making these paintings. So uh, this first painting um, is titled Tunnel Visions 3. Uh, I made it in 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Um, as the title indicates, I've, I've made a couple others that are similar to this. Um, so you'll notice my paintings are, um, they're, I call them optical field paintings. So I'm, I'm definitely honoring and working in the tradition of uh, the op artists of the 60s. Um, the major difference between my work and the op artist's work of the 60s is that they were making um, perfectly pristine paintings uh, that were creating optical effects. So when you saw them in person, you saw no evidence of brush strokes, you saw no imperfections. I mean, they were like completely perfect. Um, and they're incredible, and, I, and I, I've always admired them. Um, uh, a lot of uh, uh, other um, names for that movement are like um, the perceptual movement, or um, sometimes people refer to them as like math artists, uh, because there's a lot of like equations going on and a lot of that, and um, I'll talk more about that later. Uh, but this painting, um, and the way that I the way that I approach optical uh, field painting is with a lot of um, irreverence, and um, you'll notice there are a lot of like undulations and bleeds and disruptions in the field. Um, I do this because I'm operating in a very different context than these optical field painters of this of the '60s. You know, um, I'm I'm working against the backdrop of technology, which has you know, the ability to create any of these optical illusions in like a really, um, in a really perfect way, right? Like they're, you know, any of these paintings could be made on a computer, um, but what makes them, what makes them special, what makes them different is the fact that I can make them, um, is, is that I can make them on, sorry, hang on one second. Um, what makes them different is, is the fact that I'm like making them with, with my body, my, my body as like a computer and my brain as a computer. Um, so I really, I, I love to start with this painting because it's sort of, um, it references this idea of, of domestic, like consumer idealism. And um, it does that with like this really familiar textile pattern that, you know, we've all kind of seen. It's like, you know, that the tablecloth or like that gingham dish towel your mother had in her, in her kitchen. Um, and I like thinking about it in terms of like, um, especially with, with the idea of ritual, um, you know, it's, it's like an honoring of this tradition of, 
of domesticity and femininity and like this tradition of women's work. Like I'm very inspired by um, textiles and quilting and, um, you know, these like really repetitive processes um, that, you know, have been used as tools to kind of keep women quiet for, you know, since the beginning of time, we were, we were tasked with this responsibility of, of clothing everyone. And uh, so anyway, I, um, the, the title of this painting is called Tunnel Visions. It's a reference to a symptom of PTSD where you experience something called tunnel vision, where you, um, you dissociate and you have a really hard time with your depth perception and every, everything kind of falls away in the peripheral and all you can see is what's directly in front of you and you kind of um, space out, if, if so to speak. Uh, so that's something that happens physically in front of this, this painting I've noticed and the paintings that I've made that are like it. Uh, if you if you view it really close, you sort of it, it's kind of dizzying and um, it is sort of nauseating to look at right now. Uh, but anyway, um, a bit about my process. Um, I I do all of these paintings using using painters tape. I have painters tape in all sorts of different widths. You can buy it anywhere. Um, they're all like a really multi layered process. I don't do any measuring. I eyeball everything. Um, and, and they're actually like pretty intuitive the way that I build these up, which I think a lot of people are surprised by. Um, you know, sometimes I'll have a plan, uh, but I don't always adhere to that. They just sort of, um, they just sort of appear. So, um, all right, so I'm gonna go to the next painting. All right, so this painting is titled uh, um, Aftershock Treatment One. It is part of a three painting series um, of works that are a reference to, um, it's actually a, a, a film that came out in 1981. It's a Richard O'Brien film called Aftershock Treatment. And it was supposed to be like a six year delayed uh, Rocky Horror Picture Show sequel and it totally flopped. And I actually really love this film visually. Um, it's like, it's like a, a comedic musical film of like all original scores. And um, what I like most about it is it's this like, it's this queering of that domestic consumer idealism, like especially of like, that was like born in the eighties, you know, with like the strip malls and like the mega malls and, um, you know, this turn from like um, local neighborhood businesses to like major corporate um, capital greed. And uh, I, I just really love that, that like queering of the domestic. I mean, for instance, there's one, there's one song um, that's performed by like a famous drag queen and he's like in drag, but as a, as a like very like, you know, strong white man, like mowing the yard. And, and it's just like, it's just really silly and weird and inverted and, um, and I love it. So yeah, again, this painting, um, it's all done with like layers of tape lots of repetitive stuff going on. And again, with the idea of ritual, I'm thinking about ritual in terms of like um, the, the micro to the macro of ritual, like the mundane everyday tasks that we do, like mowing the yard or like doing the dishes or like, you know, brushing our teeth. You know, everybody has a certain way that they do these things, like they are rituals. And so I think about that, like when I'm, when I'm in the process of making these paintings, they do something to me where I, can really um, zone out and, and all my worries or fears kind of fall away. And I'm able to just kind of meditate on this process of like really exacting repetitive um, movements. So, okay. So this painting is titled Analytical Mind. Uh, I made this painting in 2018. It's, um, the other two paintings were about three feet by three feet. This painting is five by five feet square. Um, this painting is unique because I did do a lot of planning in order to make it. I did do some measuring. Um, so, you know, the, the imperfections sort of show up in like in the, the bleeding areas. Um, you know, again, it's, I, I'm, I'm specifically using these like reds and blues to reference like these American consumer ideals. Um, 
you know, but I'm, I'm really, I was really trying to achieve like more of an optical effect with this one uh, and, and reference, you know, obviously this like very iconic plaid. Um, so this is a pretty masculine sort of um, performing painting. But again, with ritual, you know, I, I, I didn't actually, I don't ever actually measure the spaces between the taped lines. You know, I think when I did, I did measure like, um, you know, where each larger square would be, if that makes sense. Um, and then just to make sure that I have enough to go all the way across. Um, but then within each one, I allow myself, you know, some freedom to just sort of um, to fudge it and just enjoy myself while I'm doing it and not have to be so rigid and, and perfect. Um, so yeah, and, and, and the title Analytical Mind is, um, it's referring to um, that, that voice in your head that just like won't shut up, you know, and you're like, if you're trying to meditate or you're trying to do something quiet and it's just like spinning around and around, it's that hamster wheel that just like never stops and is constantly analyzing and judging and worrying and planning. And um, that voice is big and loud in my head. And this process of painting, ironically, uh, quiets that and gives me some space where I can just be present and not, you know, have to worry about all these all these things that need to be done. Um, so, yeah, that's um, that's analytical mind, and obviously that's again it all ties into ritual. I mean, this is all like a larger um, ritual for me of 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 meditating and like returning to myself. Um, and that's what I love about being in the studio and like having this time, this quiet time. It's just, um, especially living in a city, there's so much movement, you know, being able to just like really quiet my mind and create these paintings that are again, paradoxically like very loud and, and like, um, and repetitive. And um, I just think that's really, that's interesting. So, let's see. So this painting was actually created at the same time as uh, the painting before it. I know they look very different, um, but I was preparing for a show where I was showing these two paintings um, in San Francisco. And when I made this painting, um, I just had that bottom layer of the, the yellow and the, and the pink. And I still didn't know what I was going to do on the top layer. I kind of had a loose idea. I wanted to like use these like silkscreen squares to sort of reference like patchwork and quilting. Um, because I, I actually grew up in the South and my, my parents or my, my maternal grandmothers were quilters from Kentucky and they were um, incredible. I actually have one of their quilts that's like over a hundred years old in my bedroom. And you know, I've always been in awe of like, of that process and that patience and that diligence. And um, I wanted to sort of honor it like in a painting the best way that I could. So I knew that I wanted to do this patchwork thing, um, but I just hadn't decided what I wanted to do with the colors. And so um, I was writing Bart one day to my studio and um, I experienced, I, I was attacked with a fire extinguisher. Somebody sprayed me in the face with a fire extinguisher and it was like a really horrible experience. Um, but my whole life flashed in front of me in that moment. We were actually underneath the, the tunnel coming from Oakland to San Francisco. So it was really loud. We were under the water. And um, prior to that, I'd had so many like crippling fears about being on that train like on that exact route, like I'd thought about it in my head a million times, like oh, the horrible things that could happen, you know, um, if there were like a crack in the foundation, you know, just all these different um, doomsday scenarios around like me being stuck on this train. And then this happened to me. And I thought for sure that was it, I was dead. And um, I didn't die obviously. And I got to my studio and I realized, um, okay, this is what I have to do. I have to figure out some way of like representing like that haze, like that, um, that uncertainty. And that's when I decided to, to finish these, these last two layers um, in gray. And um, 
So the title from for this painting is called pre-experience, which is basically another word for like for visualization. And it can be um, the word visualization is sort of like, you know, it's very woo woo and it implies like, oh, you visualize your ideal partner and then and then you get there and you and you meet this person. Um, but this is sort of like um, the opposite end of the spectrum. Like I pre-experienced you know, a horrible thing happening on public transit and then a horrible thing happened to me on public transit. And so, um, yeah, it's this idea that like, um, whether I liked it or not, I created a, a ritual that that produced an outcome, um, you know, that wasn't necessarily negative or positive. I'm actually pretty grateful for that experience now. But um, anyway, very much all tying back into um, to this idea of ritual. So, uh, all right, sorry, I'm like, this, this, I feel like I'm kind of not doing great transitions between paintings, but anyway. Uh, so this is, uh, this is a painting called, I'm just gonna check how I'm doing on time, great. Uh, this is a painting called Spelling. I made this painting um, also in 2020. So, um, yeah, lately I've been thinking a lot about um, about like plays on words and um, you know how there are some words that have um, a lot of words that have double meanings, right? And I, I love the word spelling because it does, you know, um, have that. It is um, it's describing, you know, putting words together or putting letters together to create words, of course. Um, but then it also is like um, you know, there's casting a spell, like you are spelling. Um, and that's what we do with our words all the time. And I, I just, you know, I think about sometimes like when I'm making these paintings, I feel like I'm writing, if that makes sense. Like it's very similar to that like monotonous, repetitive, like ritualistic um, process of like, you know, filling lines in. And, um, and so that's sort of where the idea for this painting came from. I've done this, this sort of like um, composition many times in di many different iterations, but um, there's something like so dizzying about like the off kilter um, diagonal of it. And I do feel like it um, starts to symbolize like, um, like cellular, like mitosis or something, you know, where cells split. Um, and so it definitely has that, uh, it definitely has that like very ritual feeling to me of like of like creation or like rebirth um if that makes any sense it makes sense in my head uh and again you'll you'll notice you know there are like moments of disruption within the optical field um there are moments of like you know the colors are bleeding a little bit and you know people ask sometimes are these are these intentional do you know when like where they're going to bleed and the answer to that is no, like I, I really, um, I, I want there to be disruptions, but I don't necessarily know, or can, I can't possibly plan where they're going to show up. And in that way, this like, it makes this process really exciting to me because while I am controlling a lot of aspects of it, um, I'm also completely out of control with, with how the final product is going to look. And sometimes these don't even create optical illusions. And I'm just like, well, you know, can't use that one. Um, or I figure something else out with it, um, do another layer. Uh, so anyway, that is um, that is spelling. Uh, and this painting is is small. This is the smallest in the in the show. It's 24 by 24 inches. All right, and then this is my most recent painting. I made this one in March of this year. Um, it's titled Nowhere slash Now Here. Um, again, I'm really interested in this, I, this like play on words. And I recently, um, you know, to, to get back to um, the concept of, um, of ritual, I recently, um, had a realization that I had an, another near-death experience when I was about 20. It was back in like 2008. I was scuba diving and I drowned and I came to on the surface. And I, you know, I don't think I was clinically dead or anything like that, but I did experience like, you know, what a lot of 
people who have had NDEs experience, which is like this great feeling of euphoria. I saw a light um, and I wasn't afraid. It was, it was very bizarre. But uh, what happened to me after that experience is I, I came back, um, I was studying abroad in Australia at the time and I, I came back, um, I finished up my degree and I, I just realized when I got home, like I had to change everything about my life. I dropped a bunch of my friends. I just focused all of my time and energy on making art. And I just like had this feeling like I knew I had to do this. Like, this is what I'm here for. And um, I wanted to make a painting that kind of honored that, that moment. And um, so, yeah, this is again, um, another very, it's, it's another very like ritual based process in building up the painting. I started in the very center. Um, it's all the same width of, of tape that's making up the white lines. And then I just sort of like one after the other moved out all the way out. Um, and yeah, it's like, it's kind of off center. Like there are a lot of disruptions and bleeds and moments where it doesn't necessarily, um, it doesn't look perfect. And I'm really happy with it. I feel very, um, I feel very pleased with the way that it turned out because again, you know, we can do everything we can to, to, to control our lives and to make things perfect, but it, you know, it never actually works out that way. So um, yeah, I think I pretty much wrapped it up um, or I think I pretty much said everything I want to say about these paintings and I'm, I'm very interested if anybody has any questions. Um, I can so interesting. Thank you so much. If anyone has any questions, feel free to unmute yourself and just shout them out or you can put them in the chat, whatever works best for you guys. I'm, I'm curious um, if uh, the you've talked a lot about the, the techniques that you're using to get at kind of your your narrative, if you will, um, and and how they reinforce the, the story that you're trying to tell the viewer. I'm curious in your studio if there's parts of your process where it works the other way, where you uncover new ways of having chance invade your process that inform your narrative, if that question makes sense. Hmm. Um, kind of. Uh, are you asking like, am I, do I, do I like, do I do other things, other, uh, can you clarify? I'm sorry. <laughs> yeah, no, no problem at all. Um, I mean, it, 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 um, it seems to me like you, you, you know, you have an established vocabulary that you use to, to get across um, what you're trying to get across. And I'm just wondering like how you develop that vocabulary, right? Like, obviously if you put a piece of paint that da uh, tape down and you paint over it, it might bleed through, but how much, maybe play is the right word for it, right? Like, is do you have play time where you uncover new ways of getting different visual effects to either get at the same point or possibly that that maybe even change your mind about what your work is about some way? Oh yeah, absolutely. Okay, yeah, I, I, think, I, I think I know what you're getting at here. Um, so yeah, play is, you know, I've had people ask this question before, like, are you having fun, <laughs> you know, and, um, and the answer is actually yes. Like this is a really, um, this this process for me is like surprisingly like really soothing. And, um, you know, but I, I do hear what you're saying and like that, that those elements of chance, like they come in when I'm mixing color. So I didn't really talk much about like how important color is for me, but like, um, you know, I don't, I don't really do anything um, you know, just, I, I plan all the colors um, up, up to a certain point. So I, you know, while I'm mixing a color, I put it down and then I, I let myself like react to whatever I put down, if that makes sense. I'm, I do, I do some other processes that there aren't, they aren't represented in, um, in this show, but I, I do some other processes that are much more like loose and, um, and experimental and intuitive. Um, but I always sort of end up bringing back in the elements of like the, the meditative, like the tape paintings um, on top of that. So uh, yeah, I don't know if that answers your question. Thanks okay. for sharing. Yeah, of course. Thank you for your question. Anybody else?
For those of you who just joined, we got a couple new people. We are doing a Q&A with Rebecca now. She just went over her painting. So if you have any questions for Rebecca, then please feel free to shout them out or put them in the chat. How long does a painting like this so take good to see everybody. Oh, um, let's see. This painting, well, I build everything myself. I stretch my canvas. Um, so with all of that considered, um, if I'm working every day, it'll be about a three week process. Um, so I actually work fairly quickly and I'm really lucky in, in that regard. I think um, I sort of get an idea and it's like, I, it's like a compulsive thing. Like I just have to finish it. <laughs> um, but I also, you know, work on a lot of paintings at once, um, you know, while that's going on. So like, I can't, I can't stand to like have to wait for paint to dry. So I'm just constantly bounce, bouncing around. Um, so it's hard for me to like get a gauge on how much, how long each painting takes. But yeah, I, I think this one did take me about three weeks. Did you study optical illusions to get here? Um, hi, Morgan. Hi. Yeah, I uh, thank you for this question. Yeah, you know, um, it's funny because in school, um, they very briefly go over the op art movement, but it's sort of like glossed over as this um, novelty movement. Um, and so I kind of, I saw it in the textbooks and was like, wait, no, hold on. I want to hear more about this. Um, so yeah, I, I just sort of built my own library. It's sort of, I found that a lot in art school, like, you know, they'll give you a little taste of something, but if you really want to learn more, you've got to go and, and do that research yourself. So yeah, I mean, I've studied a lot of, um, you know, I see as many shows as I can in person of op artists. Um, some of my favorite op artists are Bridget Riley, of course. Um, there's an artist, his name is Julian Stanzik. He just died a few years ago, but he is actually, he only has one arm. He lost his dominant arm in, um, in World War II. And um, he makes these incredible optical paintings with one arm and he just had to train himself how to use the other arm. So um, anyway, I'm just, I'm super inspired by these kinds of, these kinds of people. But yeah, I did a lot of, a lot of research. Thank you for sharing about your process. This is just fascinating. These are sublime and experiential. I can't wait to see them in person. Thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I would love to show you. Hey, Vlad, do you have any questions? Vlad is my student. <laughs> A very happy student. Um, yeah, I, I was actually wondering, like, as I'm looking at this painting specifically, uh, and I see the kind of um, the changes in value of uh, across this kind of like gradient, how much of this is planned versus how much of this is uh, just like the, the bleeds that you couldn't predict? Um, yeah, actually, um... That's another pretty amazing thing about about like the optical illusion. So where it looks like there are lighter values like, like in the middle here in like the larger field, that's actually just the white that's the white tape that's closer together. Um, you know, and then down here it looks darker, but the re it's just, you know, the white tape f further apart. Um, not white tape, I'm sorry, taped areas, it's paint. Um, but you know, I, I do hear what you're saying. Like there, there is an element. Like I knew going in that if I made these layers of tape closer together here in the middle, that there would be like it would sort of create like a, a cross situation. Because um, I've done this this painting or something similar to it before, and it didn't have that effect. And I thought, you know, I want to make that happen. Um, you know, but there are other areas like right here. I didn't expect that to, you know, I didn't expect this part to happen or, you know, I didn't expect this, but, you know, it happens and it's like, I have an opportunity cor to correct it in real time, you know, but I usually make the decision to just leave it because I feel like if it, if it happened, it, it, needs, it needed to happen. Um, yeah, thank you for that question. Did I answer it?
Looks like that might be it for questions, unless anyone else has anything. Layla, do you have any questions? No, I'm like putting everybody on the spot. No, okay. Um, I learned yeah, thank you, you Rebecca, um, about your work. I didn't, I love textiles and I had not known the story behind pre-experience and how your family, you know, worked in quilting and they were drawing on that sort of familial history through that. But when you say that, it really does look like a patchwork quilt. It's fabulous. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. Yeah, I really, I, I just love it so much. I love that whole process is I, I've learned to quilt recently in the last couple of years and it's so humbling and irritating and <laughs> you know it's like talking about like letting go of perfectionism like that is all that that process is it is it's so difficult um I have the utmost respect for for quilters so thank you yeah all right, well, thank you so much everyone for joining. We had such a wonderful talk with Rebecca Kaufman. Her work is on view at Charlotte Russell Contemporary until May 26, 2021. It's also available to see online at charlotterussellcontemporary.com. And of course, um, through Rebecca's website and her Instagram as well, she does a great job of posting progress photos and that sort of thing. So make sure to give her a follow as well. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, that was awesome. Thank you all for coming. Really good to see everybody. <laughs> all right, have a good Monday, everybody. Bye. 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 -bye. Bye, -bye.